I'd like to welcome you to my Thursday Bread History Seminar Workshop. I am broadcasting from my kitchen in Santa Cruz, California. My name is William Rubel. You can find my book, Bread, a Global History, at Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, and other online sources, possibly also at your public library. I'm writing a larger bread history, and really this work in the seminar series is feeding into this new work that I'm writing. So thank you very much for for watching. Um, you can go to my Facebook group, Bread History in Practice, join the group. That's where you will get notifications of, of the live seminars. And also you will see what people are posting who have attended, attended the seminar. If you want to make breads that are mentioned, then go to my website, williamrubel.com. I don't have all of the recipes from each of these seminars posted, but increasingly I do. So you uh, should look there first in the category uh, seminar. Now I always start, I always start with the same two slides. And so I'm going to do that now. Bread is an invention, like a chair, a car, a shoe, or a necklace. Bread is not an agricultural crop. And that's really, really an important concept. It is not an agricultural crop. No farmer ever picked a bread from a tree. No farmer grew a bread in a field. Bread is something that is created. And it's a creation of culture. And today's talk with our guest lecturer, Tony Chuhan, who's going to be going deep into flour, is really going to be talking to us about sort of the center of the invention of bread. Because if you just harvest the grains and uh, stir, up, stir them up with some water in a bowl, you don't, you don't get bread. <laughs> you, just get, you, just get some, you just get some loose grains. So, so the, 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 the magic, the, 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 the center of what makes bread bread is of course the flour. Uh, flour is the biggest ingredient in bread. Bread is flour. And uh, so in this talk today, you're going to get a sense for how the miller manipulates the grain to produce the flour that then the baker takes to the next step. Now, I know people are often, often talking about the best bread, the best bread. This is the best bread. And, and I say, I say, you know, you guys, 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 look up at the stars at night. Now, if you live in a big city, I'll say the next time you're out on a camping trip, look up at the stars at night. You know, when there's the whole canopy of the heavens with the, with the, the Milky Way. And try to find the recipe there for the best bread. And you're gonna find lots of starry patterns. And if you have, you know, a, a smartphone that you can point up to the heaven, it'll give you names, you know, Cassiopeia, for example. But it's not going to come up with a, with, 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 here's the best bread. Because the recipe for the best bread is in, is in our hearts. Uh, and I think we're going to find today with what Tony is talking to us about, milling from the ancient world to the present, that one of the secrets of each of our best bread is in, is in the milling. So without more ado, I turn you over to Tony Shahan. The various technology that makes the flowers in the historic recipes and receipts that we look at. Um, the one thing I also want everybody to think about is exactly what you think you know about mills versus what you may learn today, uh, because one of the big things that we have come across over the last few years is we have a very set idea of what mill, a historic mill is uh, based on the iconography that's been taught to us over the years. A perfect example is the mill in this photo. Uh, some of you may have seen this, it's the Mabry Mill uh, on the Blue Ridge Parkway. It's one of the most photographed mills in the world. Um, People look at this and think of the iconic American colonial mill. 
In fact, this building was built in 1903 as a blacksmith shop and wheelwright shop and later convert, converted into a grist mill. Um, so we have to uh, take a look closely at everything, which is why when we started researching the mill's uh, history at Newland Grist Mill, we decided to understand the early colonial history. Uh, we needed to go back and look at milling from the beginning and see where we fell into the timeline of traditions. So when I say we're going back early, we're, we're starting early. Um, gonna look at the grinding technology a little bit, uh, mostly in what happens with it because it does change through different technologies and times and that affects the flour that we're making. Saddle stones, I'm sure most of you have seen. It's basically two stones, uh, one of them usually rounded or flat, rubbing against another one. Um, that causes a braiding uh, or crushing of the grain, which creates a specific kind of particle coming out of that process. Uh, as they got more population and needed more food, we had to increase our ability to do that. So they started making their rubber st rubbing stones uh, with reservoirs in them, like you see in the slab mill. Uh, so they could fill that with grain and it would automatically feed. The next step in the technological advancement of grinding though is the one that really is truly the most important because it changes the grain uh, or changes the flour in a very important way. First of all, they use gravity, so the, you're only pushing half the time. Uh, larger reservoirs, so you can actually work longer without stopping to refill. But most importantly, if you look at the grooves on the stone, it actually has furrows cut in it. And instead of crushing, that grain is now being shorn. It's being cut. Uh, and you're cutting it into multiple small pieces. What that does is it makes angular particles which get caught in screens better. So this makes sifting a lot easier than crushing a flour. Um, when it comes to the lever mill, uh, obviously you can do more work with a lever. Um, you still have the furrows, a larger reservoir. This particular type of stone actually is very closely associated with uh, the grain civilizations uh, in Egypt and the Fertile Crescent. Um, so that starts to show you that we're starting to have larger and larger civilization. We need to actually have more food uh, and they've developed ways to do it. From that technology bursts and it really becomes difficult to try to understand if there was any kind of a flow or we just got very creative and went in a lot of directions. The one commonality in all of these directions is we go from a back and forth motion to a circular motion, uh, which is much more efficient. Uh, the most common one we probably have seen, uh, particularly from Pompeii, is the Roman hourglass mill. Uh, although it's in other cultures other than Roman as well. Um, you can fill that up, run it around, and it'll automatically just continually feed grain into it. The one downfall that this grinding technology has though, is that it has no way to adjust it. So the flour coming out of it is based on how much it's worn um, and the actual quality of the, the grain going in. Uh, they have now you switched over though from manpower to either manpower or animal power. Uh, and when they talk about the importance of slaves in early Roman culture, this is one of the reasons why, is they were doing a lot of the grinding uh, was actually slave labor. The quern um, is a typical rotary stone, but it's designed for either a small operation or even home uh, for grinding what you need. Uh, it just a little bit of, of uh, effort. Now, even though it's a small stone, it still has an adjustment. So you can actually control the quality of uh, and the size of the particles by the difference between the stones. Uh, there's a small spindle or shaft in the middle of that 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 top stone rests on. We all have seen millstones, hopefully, of different kinds. Um, they are the ones that are making us be able to produce um, 
close to 5,000 pounds of flour a day out of a water power mill. A uh, couple stones operating and, and you can run about 150 pounds of grain through one of these stones in an hour. Um, and you also are moving to other sources of power like water power. This is what one of those Roman hourglass stones look like. You can see by the broken top piece how it angles upward. Um, and while they didn't have furrows, if you look at the quern to the right, uh, you can see they did chip small grooves. Um, and by doing that, you get some shearing action, but you're still crushing as well. And also notice that their querns are also conical in shape. Uh, so that, that's a technique that the Romans particularly, both of these pieces are Roman and are actually in the Museum of London. We figured out how to power these mules. Uh, they start taking on shapes, what used to be thought of as um, the one on the left was always referred to as a Norse mill. And that's actually a misnomer because you find these all over Europe, even down into the Mediterranean. Uh, and what we believe now more is that these are based on the water flow capabilities because it's a really low head, low power wheel. Uh, it's a simple shaft that goes from the water wheel up to the millstone, and those two pieces are put on either end of it. Um, the other one is a Vitruvian mill. Uh, now these occurred from at least the first century uh, way into the 20th century uh, as operating uh, systems, both types were. The Vitruvian mill is named after Vitruvius, who was a Roman uh, engineer from the first century. And what's shocking as a historian to realize is that he writes the first written description of a vertical water wheel mill. I could take that and put and walk through my 1700s mill and there's nothing changed in there other than a few gears. Everything is recognizable. So it's small adjustments in that time period that change the way milling occurs. But I think that they're also very important adjustments. But to give you some idea on how some of this works, this is your basic wheel. Uh, down below, as you see, it's just a small shaft. Uh, and at the top of that, you have a small millstone. And I'm going to be quiet while these videos run because I have a few of them through here, only for the fact that half of the experience of being in a mill is the sound uh, of listening to the, the actual machine and structure come alive with uh, its activity. Uh, this is a typical Vitruvian style mill. Um, it had a Hurst frame, which is a structure that absorbs all the vibration. Uh, and in that you have the gear. Uh, the one thing that the gearing does do in a Vitruvian mill is it allows us to change direction in moving of motion. Uh, so we have a large gear in the back you see running into a lantern gear in a vertical shaft. What makes this mill special is that it has what's called a fixed rind. And you see the inset in the upper left hand corner. Uh, it's set onto the top of that shaft and that millstone, the top millstone sets on top of that. It's actually attached to it, uh, usually with lead or not. Uh, they're leaded in and that millstone becomes a shaft is not perfectly vertical. It's gonna be damaging the millstone and it'll be damaging the grain all at the same time um, because it'll be coarse on one side and fine on the other. Very important to be able to dial this in to be perfectly accurate. Once you do that, it, your way of grinding, it gives you a, or can give you a finer flower, a lot less forgiving uh, in its activity. That actually stays in place until the mid 18th century when they get what's called a balanced ring in. And you see, there's one of them setting on top of the millstone uh, in this image. 
and it would be built into the other stone setting next to it. And you see the inset on the left. And it basically has a dimple in the center. And the shaft coming up through has a little point. Um, and that rests on there and floats so that if you have any problems, that millstone will adjust to it uh, and not actually cause as much damage to itself or to the, the flower being produced. What you also have to remember though is that these things are moving at, well, we, we found out recently that in the early 1800s or early 1700s, early 18th century, the millers were running these at about 150 revolutions a minute. Uh, so anything goes wrong, you could actually get one bouncing and there's a three quarter inch piece of wood between you and a 1200 pound piece of bouncing stone. Uh, so having some flexibility and some safety uh, is very important. Now, there are several different kinds of power systems for these early mills. Uh, usually they focused on wind and water. Um, they're also very efficient. This has the equivalent of about a water hose running over it to make it run like that. Uh, one important note to make though is that gearing was limited in this time. So for every set of millstones the mill had, it had its own set of water wheel. Uh, and you would have multiple water wheels on the same mill. And that lasts up until about 1720. Um, typical kind of windmill. Uh, you have two basic types, one like this, which is called a smock mill that has a cap up on top. Uh, and that cap spins around so you can adjust to whichever way the wind is coming from. Uh, and the little tail fan in back helps uh, keep that in the wind. Uh, and we'll, we'll continue to do that uh, even as the wind changes. The other kind of mill is called a post mill, which has a wooden post up through the middle and the entire mill rests on that one single post. And one of my favorites are boat mills. Uh, we're finding that these were actually a lot more common. You see them, uh, but we're finding more evidence of them even up into Ohio and the, the old Northwest uh, in America. And you basically build a mill in a boat and pontoon off to the left and you mount your water wheel uh, in between those two. That water wheel will raise and lower uh, and you use the current of the river uh, to make your machinery work. There are very few of these left. Uh, there's only about a dozen that I think I know of that are still in operation in Europe and most of those are Eastern Europe. Uh, this one happens to be a museum of milling uh, that they brought this one in. But when it comes to the grindstones themselves, um, most people are looking at three basic kinds of grindstones. Um, in the lower right hand corner, you have what are called conglomerates, uh, usually some sort of sedimentary stone that's been metamorphically changed uh, into uh, a harder type, but you can see all the gravel embedded in those. Um, these are the basic ones. These are what people are making in your community and supplying to mills, uh, which is fine when you're doing just grinding for your community. But when you start to export, you're always looking for what makes my flour better. Uh, how can I get more flour out of the grain that my customers are bringing me? The first thing that they adopted was in the upper right hand corner. Uh, in the 17th and early 18th centuries. Um, these were called Cullen stones, C-U-L-L-E-N. Uh, that's actually a bastardization of Cologne, Germany, which is where this basaltic stone came from. Um, and they write in early America that these are preferred for grinding corn. Um, which as we talked about before uh, in the series that I'm uh, talking about grinding uh, any kind of grain for the most part. Um, 
what most people are usually familiar with are the French burr stones in the upper left-hand corner. These are only found in the Loire Valley uh, outside of Paris. Um, they're a freshwater quartzite. They're actually a nine on the hardness scale of 10. Uh, they're, but they're also filled with pockets. So you have a quartzite stone, a hard stone with lots of um, small pockets that allow that shearing action to occur, to occur even if your dressing wears down. And you can see on this one that the grooving or the, what we call the dressing of it uh, is, is just faint because it's been used until it's almost used out. These are also quarried in nodules, so they have to be cut into geometric shapes and fit together like a big puzzle and then held in place with a metal band. The back is then filled with plaster and stone to give it the weight. And as the stones wear down, because these the stone part itself is usually somewhere between 17 and 24 inches thick. And as that wears down, they will add more plaster and stone onto the back of it to keep the weight as it needs to be. All of this changes when a gentleman comes along by the name of Oliver Evans. Uh, he was born in Newport, Delaware. Uh, he was, for all intents and purposes, a very cantankerous man. Uh, Thomas Jefferson once described him as uh, the most despicable inventor in America. Uh, and to Evans's uh, benefit, he actually won the court case against Jefferson for infringing upon his patent. Uh, because what Evans did was he was the first person to ever patent a system rather than an individual machine. And he received US patent number three for the first automated mill in the world. Um, he also developed the Columbia steam engine, which was one of the first high pressure steam engines. And he developed a dredging machine that he drove under steam power around Rittenhouse Square in Philadelphia in 1805. It's considered the first automobile in the world. So this man is, is way ahead of his time. He also died broke because of it. Uh, but what he did was he developed a mill that you could dump raw material in one end and get a finished product out the other. Uh, and he did that based on thousands of years of technology and simple technology. He used Archimedean screws to move things horizontally and he used bucket elevators to move things vertically. Um, those have been around for centuries. Um, so, but he changes the way milling occurs and he actually affects the world in general, be, particularly in America because we see an industrial revolution occur right after this. And what happens is it takes eight to 10 people to run a mill like this prior to Oliver Evans. When he comes along, it takes two. Um, so you have anywhere from six to eight individuals and let's just say in Delaware where he was working in Northern Newcastle County, there were a hundred mills in operation by 1800. Uh, so he comes along and he frees up six to 800 workers that have uh, what would be called mechanics working in this technology, understanding water power. At the same time, we're trying to build other industries. Uh, so it was really the basis for a lot of things that happened in America and the world. The one thing he did invent was the hopper boy, uh, which was an automatic rake. Um, and these were very important because most mills are filled with humidity, particularly in, in the mid-Atlantic where we're at. And when you're putting that much friction of those stones working 120 to 150 revolutions a minute, uh, it collects in that flour. And if you go to put those into a screen, it will clog up and gunk up and make milling and sifting almost impossible. So he developed this automatic rake um, that it fell in the middle and it slowly pushed it to a hole on the outside. Uh, we would consider this bad, but in his day, what he did was he removed an actual hopper boy, somebody whose job it was to set and rake every bit of flour that came out so he could go and put it through a sifter. Now, the last bit of technology we're going to see, we just saw it in the early bit of the 19th century. And that is 
a bank of rolls uh, or rollers. Uh, these are oftentimes referred to as roller grinders. And what you have is a series of rollers that stack on top of one another. And usually you have a bank of about five to six of these different rollers. And each one of those rolls is a different corrugated texture. So what we are doing here is an attrition type of grinding now. So that we're not crushing it, we're not cutting it. We're literally peeling off a little bit at a time until we can get into uh, the center. And by doing that, we can take uh, that little bit we're peeling off and put it through a sifter time after time after time and get every bit of fine flour out that's possible. Uh, and by the 19th or uh, early 19th uh, century, that's the goal is to make more and more fine flour so we can export it. And you can see that they run very much uh, in different directions, so they're peeling it off. Um, that kind of ends the technology. And this is my mill, uh, particularly it's a 1704 Nathaniel Newland grist mill. It's actually operated all but 20 years since 1704 when it was built. And when we started furnishing it for the um, furnishing plan that we recently did, we went backward, as I had said earlier. Um, and to do that, we actually started in the classical world. Um, going all the way back to Greeks and Romans, um, we see here um, that the writers in this period constantly wrote about milling and the, the sifting process. Matter of fact, the Greeks have, uh, if I remember correctly, it's 19 different words for flour uh, and different kinds of flour. Um, Pollux actually indicates that it's the introduction of linen that actually in the sifting process that produced the first screen suitable for making fine flour. Uh, and Pliny actually describes a two sieve process uh, necessary to make uh, the flour that they were looking for. Some of this can be seen in Roman monuments. Uh, the top one is actually off of a uh, sarcophagi. Um, and you can see that Roman mill being animal powered on the left. And on the right, it's a series of his tools. Uh, there's three buckets uh, or measures uh, in the lower right hand corner. Uh, and then in the upper uh, right is actually a pierced wood sieve. Um, so they had a drilled holes in it and, and sifted that way. The one on the upper left and the lower left are both woven. Uh, we can't get much detail, but it looks like a, a reed of some form. Uh, now we also find um, a baker who's also referred to as a pistrinum uh, in a relief of this guy's tomb because at that time that word is actually synonymous between mill and bakery uh, and that's because it's all joined together. Uh, in this period to try to control and supply enough flour for their population centers they had to bring all of this together. Uh, this is just one small clip out of it. There's a whole string that goes from milling all the way through uh, to the final baking. And I think there's actually a, a panel in it that talks about selling of bread as well. Uh, but you can see the sieves on these tables are the same things that we see much later. It's a wooden sieve um, what? covered what? with a material. That's what we don't know. Uh, exactly what the material that they were using was here. Uh, but we do know that we have references to everything from wood, hide, reed, and linen uh, in these early Greek and Roman writings. Over time, uh, however, this system of unified integrated milling and, and baking breaks down. Uh, and by the medieval period, you end up with 
millers that manufacture meal uh, that's then bolted or sifted in bakeries, in homes, and sometimes it's even sent to separate bolting houses that were individual businesses all on their own. Uh, this relationship is very much controlled by and defined by uh, manorialism and seigneurial obligations. Uh, and even the royal edicts of this point uh, start to outline what we see later on in folk uh, traditions that millers cannot be trusted um, because the king will not allow a miller to be involved in the grain trade or actually in baking. What's interesting is bakers and bakery owners can enter, enter into the grain trade and into milling, but it can't be the reverse. Um, so there's something that happens here that we're, we're trying to track down, but you see it even in Chaucer in the description that he uses of milling uh, and millers. They're never uh, described in a positive light. Uh, there's a folk song uh, that comes out. We believe it's 17th century, but it, it's still being sung in the 19th century where a miller is on his deathbed and his three sons are brought in. And the first one, he says, you know, if I give you my mill, what will you do? And he says, well, I'll charge a 50% toll. Uh, and the miller said, no, you'll go out of business. That'll never work. Brings in the second son. And uh, he says, I'll charge a 75% toll. And he says, no, he says, you'll go broke in no time. And the third son comes in, he says, I'll charge a 100% toll father. And he gives him his mill and they go off all, and all unhappy. Uh, what has happened though, is looking at, at court records, the only time you ever see millers in court is usually when they've been robbed. Uh, you never see one of them being brought into court for um, anything illegal for the most part. What I think is happening is because of um, the estates and the fact that most estates uh, have mills that they require their tenants to use, there's this bias that's built up early on against millers because they're forced and have no control uh, over which mills they can go and what prices they have to pay because uh, that's all controlled by the, the head of the estate. The one exception to all of this is the monastery and uh, this is actually a 12th century mill in this slide um, at Fountains Abbey and this particular mill uh, is beautiful because they talk about having a two-stage bolting screen uh, system uh, installed in this mill. I'm trying to learn a little bit, but we know from the uh, dissolution records that these uh, particular mill uh, eight mills had mills, bake houses, bolting houses, and brew houses all combined in the same complex. Plus they were, have very large estates so that they were growing their own grain and had a complete control. And they were also known for their very, very fine uh, white flour, um, as you see in, in some of these uh, manchette samples down here. It's also during, um, this time that we start to see bolting going into the homes. Uh, and by the eight, or excuse me, by the 16th century, inventories of individual houses have things listed as bolting pipes, pokes, tubes, hutches, and tons. Um, and the bolting houses are oftentimes, it's very unclear whether they're a building built next to a mill uh, or they are separate individual businesses of their own. Some of them actually even look like they're attached to houses. Uh, and in 1674, John Webster actually has in his inventory something called a meal chamber that contained a tub for leavening, a tempsing tub, and two meal barrels, a Tiffany temps, and a hair temps. Uh, and the Tiffany is a fine muslin gauze uh, used for making fine flour at that time. Uh, so you're starting to see this real uh, 
diversion of these tasks. One of the questions we've always had is, is what did these screens look like? Uh, and Wheeled and Downland Museum um, in West Sussex actually has a collection of sieves. Most of them are machine made, but there's a few of them that are older handmade varieties. And that's what these pictures are. And you can see that there's everything from cloth up through reed. There's simple tabby weave to uh, some pretty intricate twill weaving. Um, and there's a big difference in sizing of what they're actually sifting here as well. Uh, so we're narrowing it down a little bit, but we want to do some experiments to see how much we can make with each one of these kinds of sews. One of the interesting things about the time period that we're talking about is that it's a time frame when it's as much about artistry and personal skill as it is about technology, even though the technology is, is advancing and changing. It's knowing how to use it that makes a difference in whether you can make a really good product or not. Uh, but even in the home, the technology continues to increase. Uh, there's a domestic encyclopedia from 1802 that describes this home bolter. It's a family bolter. Um, and that lid that fit down over the top of that actually had a hook that caught that sifter and you took those handles and moved it back and forth and it actually sifted the flour for you in your house. Uh, that would have been kept in a kitchen or a pantry. But let's go into the mills themselves. Um, we see that in early illustrations like this 1698 uh, book of trades uh, by Christoph Weigel, the elder, that they're still using hand sieves over barrels. Uh, you can see it in both of them, uh, that there's people in there doing that. The one thing that, this is the first piece of evidence though we have for a new type of sifter. And that is in the back on the image on the right. It's called an incline sifter. Um, and you would dump your meal in and it has a cam and you can kind of see the wheels uh, underneath the uh, back legs so that as those turn, that actually basically bounces up and down and lets, lets the grain move across the screen. What's interesting is this is the only time I've seen an image of one of these in a mill. Uh, the only other image that comes up in the first part of the 18th century or the middle of the uh, 18th century is in uh, Diderot's Encyclopedia of Trades and it shows up in sifting um, in a threshing barn. So what I'm thinking is that these are probably for coarse sifting and then they're doing their finer uh, finished sifting by hand as they traditionally would have. In the Ordinance of Bakers uh, Company at in York, we also come up with, um, in 1598, a six illustration uh, set of drawings that talk about the steps in making bread. Uh, and step two is bolting. And I love this illustration because it is a great technological step because it shows them uh, how they manually grabbed a bag, uh, put flour in it and shook it. Uh, and it actually, the illustration uh, talks about how they use the goose wing brush at the gentleman's foot to uh, sweep it all up. They had, however, advanced. Uh, and as I said, some of this is home. This is probably a protected uh, in the company of bakers. But you also have people that are specialized as sifters. And in the house book uh, of Nuremberg, they basically, all the brothers that retired to this particular uh, dwelling, they ended up having their portrait made in the context of what their trade was. And this guy was a flower sifter, and this is a bolting hutch. And it's a simple box. It probably has a flip down door in the back, uh, and it has a cloth hanging down the front to keep the flower from going up into his face. 
I'm assuming that he has the exact same bag uh, that the gentleman on the left has. Uh, you just can't see it because of the cloth. But we also start to see bolting hutches uh, that are a little bit more complex. Uh, in U-plot, uh, he shows this one that has a hand crank on it. Uh, this is a tradition that is starting and it continues well into uh, the late 17th century uh, when Randall Holm uh, in his Academy of Armor, when he talks about bakers, uh, shows what he calls an arc wheel. Uh, and he also talks about how it, with the help of this engine, more meal will be taken from its brand in one hour than a person can scarce or shift in a whole day. So again, we're talking about the increase in amounts, um, but we're also seeing specialization as well. There's no other sifting device illustrated in Randall Home around Bakers. Um, so I think that's an important piece to note at this point in time. Uh, we do know that the Millers were using some sorts of screens. Uh, this is actually a 1769 ad by a John Sellers, who was one of two wire weavers in North America. Um, and he made screens for everything from paper makers all the way to millers and even home use. Um, but what he's doing here is uh, this one, this particular screen that he illustrates is for cleaning grain. But even it is set up so it has a handle on it so you can see that they're still talking about in 1769, hand-operated technology. Uh, we think that these early mills uh, should be a lot more automated than they were, but for the most part, the grindstones and maybe one other device, in many cases, were run by water power. The rest of it was still all hand-operated by millers. And this is one of these, actually, thanks to Mark Meltonville, uh, who uh, looked up several of these in France for me a couple of years ago. Uh, it's a simple reel on an incline in a wooden box. Uh, the importance of this, though, is, is very well marked. Uh, if you look at the amount of time that went into the hardware on this piece, and it even has a lock and a, a really nicely forged uh, lock plate. Uh, so this isn't just a piece of equipment. This is where their flour may actually have been stored and locked away because of all those thefts I mentioned earlier uh, that we found. How it works is the grain or the meal comes in one end and it moves down a screen that would be stretched over that reel. Um, one of the interesting things that I hadn't thought about until looking at these pictures though is when we look at automatic uh, reels today, the centrifugal force actually forces the flower to the screens and it pushes it through. Uh, on those, we have to put brushes on the outside of the cloth to keep them clear. This one actually has, if you look closely, uh, these little sliding blocks that act as knockers to keep those screens clear. Uh, if you think about being in a mill where one of these are working, it's basically standing next to somebody with two pieces of wood constantly banging them together. Uh, so even though it's hand operated, this is a, not a quiet place in the mill. Um, by the 17th century, bakers are synonymous with the final sifting process. And this is one of these uh, arc reels uh, in the costume, the grotesque. Uh, this is a series of illustrations by an artist that are very common in this time period that depict a trade through all the tools and they make these bodies up um, based on all the tools that uh, make up these uh, particular jobs. Uh, and the main body of the baker is described as a bolting uh, reel. So that's very telling in itself. Actually, the first automated bolter is illustrated in 1500 by Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, 
there's not one that's actually written about and described until Romelli uh, in 1588. But the first illustration is by George Andreas Buckler in 1661, as we see here. Uh, and it's a simple, what we call a sock or a bag bolter. The meal comes out of the stones, drops through a chute into a bag in a box. And there's a cam in the gearing uh, that makes it all move uh, and shakes that. The fine stuff falls out of the bag. The coarse stuff goes out the end. And here's what one looks like working. Tony, and this is actually a German we piece. We can't that, hear any sound from your videos. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, we're not getting sound? No. Okay. Uh, don't know how to help that. Uh, I'm going to just have to go on. Uh, but one of the things that is really neat about these German sifters like this is that where the meal spout comes out are these intricately carved faces. So the meal is actually pouring out of the machine's mouth. And there's a whole lot of tr folk tradition around those. Uh, those types of sifting, the inclined sifter, the bag sifter, uh, and the real sifter are the traditions that are brought to North America by early colonists. Um, what we do is we take it in different directions. Um, and perfect example is what happens in New York and what happens in Pennsylvania. Uh, early New Yorkers uh, decide that they need to make revenue off of milling. And there's mills all up and down the Hudson Valley. Um, and the bolters in New York City get together and get the leaders to pass a tax that all flour has to come through New York City and be bolted there uh, and taxed that way. When that happens, all the millers go, well, why sh should we do that? Because they're going to take the fine stuff and get the most money out of it, uh, and we will be left out in the cold. Uh, they also realized that the Hudson River was large enough that they could sail a ship around New York City and usually never get stopped. Uh, so the, that was one of the great early traditions of American smuggling that began. Uh, on the other hand, Philadelphia was founded by the Society of Friends. Uh, their basic tenets and their beliefs were do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And if I do the best I possibly can in this world, I will receive the blessings uh, of the Lord for uh, what I do. And there's a historian of early technology that once said the Quakers came to do good and they did very well. And this is a perfect example of that because they did not base anything on taxes, but they based all of their laws and they actually wrote 29 laws between 1690 and 1767 to control flour. Uh, they controlled the containers it was shipped in, how it was shipped, all with the purpose of making the most merchantable flour possible. And what that did was people would buy the flour and they marked the barrels and they had an incredible um, quality control system of inspectors, um, and fines if you got caught trying to adulterate flour or not shipping out good flour. And when it went to the Caribbean uh, or Northern Mediterranean or Europe in any place, they knew exactly where their flour came from and they kept getting quality flour and more quality flour. While at the same time with all the smuggling coming out of New York, the other center of flour export in 1690, um, it was being adulterated. Uh, actually, in 1713, 
uh, we came across the letter that described from a mother to her daughter who was setting up a new house. And she describes how to check your flower. And that's to take a handful of flour and pour vinegar in it. And if it bubbles, you shouldn't use it because it's been adulterated with plaster so much, um, which apparently was a very common thing. Um, the Pennsylvanians made sure that didn't happen. And within 10 years, they took over the international flower market to the point that New York was claiming um, that they had been surpassed by Pennsylvania and even New Jersey's flower was better than theirs because there was so much adulteration and bad practices. So just to kind of a, do a quick summary, uh, upper right hand corner, you have an incline sifter, you have a hand crank bolter in the center top. Uh, and by the time it gets to the States, they start to do two things. They start initially in automation, which is the bottom one. You start getting these long bolters that you can't turn by hand. You have to actually have machinery. And then in the upper left-hand corner, you see mills that actually have bag bolters in them as well. Those don't tend to be anywhere else in Europe other than Germany. But because, particularly in Pennsylvania, we get those over here. So that by mid-century, what we start to see is mills with lots of cleaning devices. And if you look at the bottom floor in this next to the gears, you see meal coming out of the grindstone, going into a bag sifter, and then going into a real sifter. And uh, shortly after writing this, uh, I finally found an illustration from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where they talk about the same mill having an English and a German bolter in it. Uh, so gives you kind of an idea. One of the interesting things about uh, the ads from this period though, is as late as the 1760s, up to 50% of sifting equipment is still hand operated. Uh, so they're still doing some of it, or at least mills contain it. Uh, they may not be using it anymore, but in their inventories, they have it. And just to show you that uh, William's not the only one that has been dealing with natural disasters. This is what my week was the last week. We had two floods like this back to back three days apart. Uh, this is our mill and our store, which is now our research archive. And this is our offices. Uh, so everybody's having a fun time. And sorry about the, uh, you're on mute, William. Sorry about the sound on those videos. William, you're on mute. Okay, there I am. So I'd like to thank you, Tony. That was absolutely brilliant. It was fantastic. Everything that I had hoped for. And let's give you um, thank you. a proper round of applause for we can hear. Thank you. Um, bef before we, um, so I want to open it to questions. Um, I have just a couple really quick comments um, um, I, I, that I would like to call out from, from what you talked about. That, that, that really has, um, I don't know, sort, sort of, it interests me is that the narrative for the development of milling technology from the Roman times through to early modern Europe is this real trajectory of, 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 of growth that um, from the end of the, of the, um, of the Western Roman Empire, when its political and economic system collapsed, um, and that means also slavery collapsed. Um, no more slaves to inefficiently, you know, walk around those mills. Um, that 
during the period that is often called the Dark Age, the Dark Ages, you know, medieval times, we think closed in. Um, and, and in many ways, of course, the Christian thinking at that time was very closed in compared with the classical period. But when it comes to technology, Europeans were already um, embracing technology in the form of this milling and, and moving forward. And I think Tony alluded to this a few times that the increase in technology, the practice of the technology in the milling became the practice for the industrial revolution. Um, and as he said, it in, this whole increase in efficiency of milling increased the ease of food supply. And you know, we still have not gotten to that Malthusian moment because we keep using technology to increase the food supply as we get bigger and bigger and, and humans become more and more powerful. And now we may have comeuppance in 200 year floods in a week at Tony's place and these massive fires in California for um, getting to be a few too many of us that we can feed with our technologies. But um, I think milling really is the engine that fires European technological expansion and eventually colonialism. We conquered the world. Uh, Europe conquered the world with um, bread and, and Tony's mills. And let, let me just say one thing, William, mm -hmm. uh, on that is that's how it looks. Although I would, I would caution on one thing in that people who study technology tend to be progressive historians. Mm -hmm. uh, so it may come out that way based on the literature it, but it may be a little bit more chaotic and, and more interwoven uh, as it moves around. So sure. just a caution. Sure. And what um, also Tony alluded to is how the centralization of milling, especially under feudalism, was a way of controlling the countryside. But we don't have time. It, it's not possible in each session to do technology and, 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 and the culture. Um, questions for Tony? before we get into making the bread. We'll start the bread in, in, in at, at quarter after, in, in three minutes. Any questions for Tony? I have one. Jeff, ask your yes. question. Hey, Tony, that was fantastic. That was everything I've ever wanted to hear sitting here listening about milling. Thank you very much. Um, I have a kind of that fun technical 18th century milling question that I, I wanna hear your opinion on. Um, Types of wheat in the 18th century, we kind of generally define as household wheat and fine. I think we, I mean, I guess we can agree on that. Yes. Um, uh, what would the extraction rate on each of those be? And what would you say the volume per pound would be? I don't know that answer. And that's, okay. one, of, that, that's, that's one of my questions that I have. Uh, I thought you would have it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, because I'm, I'm just to that same point. Uh, in understanding the technology. And what I want to do is actually run some experiments um, with different grinding techniques and, and all and, and sifting and understand if there is a difference, first of all, but what if differences might be happening because of the technology. Um, okay, Jeff and, and Tony and, and everybody. I mean, that's a really great question. And um, I think I know the answer to it. Um, but it's going to be the focus of my next time I speak with a group. And I'm not sure when that might be. Um, I think I'm going to do it in, in this particular lecture will be in a month because I need the help of my teenage daughter to work on the algebra. But um, what I have done, I need to get my daughter's, um, my daughter's really good at math, um, get my daughter's help with, is um, reverse engineering the assize tables. Thank you. Um, yep. And, and I've done it already. I, I did have somebody help me who's better at math, but I'm gonna do it again. So I believe we can, re, we can reverse engineer the assize tables that explain how much, uh, what the weight of uh, a loaf is for um, a, given, a given price in the late medieval through early modern period. And from that, we can derive the Wheaton, the um, house, household Wheaton and, and, and white. Um, also, I will send you, Jeff, as I have sent Tony and, and, um, um, and anybody else who asks for it. Um, I'm trying to think of our Miller friend in Maine. Um, um, 
of the 1771 um, British Navy experiment with milling um, that is in a report to Parliament. Um, and I'll send that to you because actually um, the milling tests have been done that do um, explain precisely what the um, um, extraction rates were and they also link them to specific bolting cloths. And so maybe Tony, we could work the next a few weeks on, on working this out if you've got the time and we can try. Uh, yeah. I, I also want to tie this into um, some work that was done in the 1820s uh, to see comparison, to see if, if there's changes that are occurring over time as well. There were two Prussian spies sent to the US to examine and study our milling technology. And part of what they did was buy several barrels of flour and send them back to Prussia. And they were weighed, tested, ground, baked with, and we have those results. Uh, but they're 1820, so it's a little bit before the time frame that I deal with. But with this other that when I get it worked through, uh, I just haven't had a lot of time to, to, to work on it lately. Um, I think that there's some comparison that we can answer part of that question of, is there a change over time uh, or is there a consistency throughout? Uh, and okay. that's what I'm, I'm very unsure of at the moment. William is very much more sure than I am. Uh, I'm, I'm much more sure, that's, that's, how my, that's right. But I, I think we've got data, so I'll, let's be in touch. And anyone who wants to be involved in, 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 in meeting for an hour or two to talk about this, but working from documents, um, just just email me, you know, William at WilliamRubel.com. Um, let's move on to mixing the bread. And then Tony's going to be staying around after the meeting. So he's going to be here for us to answer questions. And again, Tony, just as with Jeff, this was really, really excellent. Um, I, I, learned, I learned a lot. I really did. So thank Good. you very much. Okay. Um, the bread, the Maslin bread. Do you need the recipe put up? Does everybody have it? Uh, where is today's bread recipe? So I will share the screen quickly. Um, hopefully I will get back to it here. Um, this one, which one is it? Uh, I, oh, this is it. Okay, we'll share this one. Okay, here's the recipe. So this is for Maslin. Tony, do you want to talk about Maslin for a minute since you're the one that recommended this? Um, I know it more on the grain side rather than on the flour side. Um, it's from my point of view, one of the reasons why I brought it up, uh, was that in 1770 in our township, in all the probation or probate records, uh, from that year, over 50 or 60% of the grain in the ground was actually, uh, described as maslin or meslin in their terms, um, which is a wheat rye mix. Um, and from my understanding of this, it's basically a, a farmer's way to hedge their bets and make sure that no matter what the uh, weather was like that year and how much drought or, or over rain or whatever, that they were able to um, have some sort of crop to go on, which is also right. important because in the time frame that I deal with in, in that uh, 18th century and, and or into early 19th century, you know, we're working into another mini ice age. So uh, it becomes an important feature there. But as um, far as flour, I'm going to leave it up to you, William. Okay. Well, I mean, that, that, that's that excellent. That, that exactly uh, perfect. So in, from Roman times in Europe and then over in um, colonial North America, uh, farmers would plant rye and wheat together in the same field. Um, wheat, will, wheat requires really good land and really nice weather to, to thrive. Um, rye can, can handle a, a cooler um, winter, a cooler summer, cooler growing season, and it also does well on poor land. It, it also likes the great land, but it can do well on poor land. So, so Maslin, this mix, of rye and wheat was very, very, very common, exactly as Tony said, it allowed the farmer to hedge the bet. Now there are no masculine recipes in English in the 18th century, zero, none. 
and there's no masculine recipes and there's no American cookbooks during that period. Um, there are masculine recipes earlier in Gervais Markham, English housewife, he's got cheat bread, which was a masculine bread. Um, but um, this is um, um, a mix um, that, as I say, if, you, if you've read the head note for the recipe, in France, and a big difference as we've talked about between English and French breaking traditions, is the French are really into precision. And their word for masculine is essentially the same, it's matai, but they separated out three matai grades um, for which there were separate market prices. A, a one to one mix, so just plain matai was 50% rye, 50% wheat. Petite matai was 25% rye and 75%, um, sorry, other way around, 75% rye and 25% wheat. And gros matai was, um, was you know, two parts, um, uh, two parts rye and one part, or the other way around. I'm mixed up, <laughs> but you have it in writing. Um, so, um, 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 Parmentier, Gustave Parmentier is most famous for the, introducing the, the, um, the potato to France. He has a couple really great bread baking books, and one of them is called um, Avis à bon manger, manager, the uh, advice for the housewife. And he has this wonderful flour he calls blé ramé, which was uh, one eighth rye, twelve percent rye. I mean, he said it makes the bread smell of violets and it keeps longer. So I've given you three options, 100% uh, white flour if you don't have rye, otherwise do the blé ramé or um, the, the, the one-third um, one rye. So how many of you have, have to have rye and are mixing it with rye today? Um, that's a few of you. Now I know Pamela, you were mix, you were doing a lot of kneading. So do you want to talk to people? Do you want to show your bread? I'm going to unshare those of you who needed it. Pamela, can you show your bread? I I, al I already it's it's risen the second time, and I have already um, put it. I'm going to form a loaf. So. We, 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 okay. We so. Pan. Yeah, it's really, a really, a really nice actually, consistency. I've actually made the loaf. I made it this afternoon using um, using half um, wholemeal einkorn and the other half used and the right proportion using rye. Um, and I baked it. I don't know if anyone can see it, but it's come out amazingly. Oh, nice, beautiful. And it actually smells incredible. <laughs> I, I haven't let anyone eat it yet because I thought I'd better show it to you guys first. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's really beautiful, Ruth. Anybody so, else have their bread that they've made they want to um, You'll find a, a rye flour can be a little bit sticky. Um, now, one common way to work is with wet hands. So I'm going to go just for two seconds, get a bowl of water for my hands. Uh, you um, work with wet hands, and I, I learned this from a Lithuanian country woman who was teaching me how to make rye bread. So you, you just keep your hands wet. Um, so I always use a bowl of water, and, and generally that will enable you to do the mixing without the, um, without can it Can you sticking. unshare your screen so that we can uh, yeah, see you without the recipe? Thank you. There we go. Um, okay, so I've, I've, so what I'm saying is I've got a bowl of water and I, I usually do this when I'm making bread. I keep a bowl of water and it's a mix and, and your, your, your hands won't stick. If they start to stick, then rinse your hands again. If you keep them clean and keep the dough from, from, from starting to stick. Um, and getting rid of it when it does, then you can work fairly wet doughs um, with your with your hand. Um, it's really quite an amazing an amazing system. Any technical questions then on this on this bread here? William, I have a question yes. per um, Carl's admonition to us that rye bread needs a low. <laughs> 
Uh, what, did, what did Carl say? Or Carl, do you want to speak up yourself? Yes. Um, can you repeat the question? It was related to the rye bread. And what did I say? Because the you, you said that rye bread needs a certain pH for the rye to actually cook. Yes, it's not the pH. It's, oh. It needs a certain amount of organic acids present, which is related to the pH. But you need when, what, what we call, when you measure the TTA, the total titratable acidity, when you make rye bread, when you make what they call uh, wheat rye bread, where you, the quantity of wheat is higher than the quantity of rye, you need a TTA of 7.5. When you have uh, rye bread, where you have more rye than wheat, you need 9.5. And when you have whole rye, you need a TTA of 11. Now that TTA comes from the acidity or the sourness of your sourdough. So in a German bakery or in rye bakeries in general, they will measure the TTA or the amount of organic acids Mm -hmm. or use a sourdough that they have prepared with a starter culture where they know that after 17 hours of fermentation the acidity of the of the sourdough is high enough and based on that on the the acidity so the tta of the 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 sourdough you know the exact amount of sourdough that you have to use in your dough in order to obtain that final acidity or when you make whole rye bread, the Germans, they use what they call the dry or vier Stufen, where they start from a small quantity of sourdough with flour and water, and gradually they build it up until they have the completed dough, which, which they have actually refreshed four times or three times until they obtain the the final dough that is acidified enough. But it is mandatory when you have an amount of rye flour in the dough that you need to acidify a little bit the rye in order to uh, stop the enzymatic activity. So Carl. Allow, allow the, the, the rye to be baked. So Carl, would you be able to use litmus paper for this just as a rough? Could you use a litmus? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I have n a litmus paper. Well, something with just a more of a, a that will sh show the pH, but it won't ah, be exact. No, no, the pH, the pH doesn't matter. But, but measuring the, the organic acids, the pH just gives you an indication if your dough is sour or basic. Okay. It will give you an indication of three point, a pH of 3.5 can have a total titratable acidity of 35 or 21. Okay. It's two different measurement methods and pH is for me in sourdough not enough or not accurate enough. It indicates is a, if a sourdough is good to use, but it has no relationship to is it ready to, or what's the, what, what, is it sour enough? And how much do I have to use to make my, my, uh, my, my sour, my rye flour sour enough? Thank you. So a pH slip will not help. Even a pH meter will not help me as an experimented baker. It will not help me. If I measure the pH of a sourdough, I would just have no idea how much, uh, I have to add in the dough because I don't know how many organic acids are in there. Because this dough, two different doughs, two different sourdoughs with the same pH can have a different level of organic acid. Okay, well, thank you, Carl. I think what we're seeing here really, though, is a sort of divide between um, sort of industrial, you know, in the professional baking to perfection and, and, and just home home baking. Um, there is a long tradition of of these maslin breads and they risen risen with yeast. So you will get a nice loaf. Um, I'm I'm have no doubt whatsoever that you know if you can you know tweak the um, 
the, the chemistry in the way that Carl is suggesting, you will probably bring out uh, more flavor or more texture. Um, but this is gonna make a very good bread. And, and for this home baking, I think we just move ahead with confidence and, and enjoy the loaf. Um, this is now 10.30, we've been an hour, Carl is laughing. Um, so we're gonna leave this room open. I'd like to thank all of you, all of you for coming today. And I'm sorry for any technical um, difficulties. It was the first time I'd set up a, a donate uh, possibility. Um, in the future, we will have a donate possibility and a free ticket possibility. It looks like the Eventbrite integration did work. They did work on their program um, in the last few weeks. Um, so I am going to promise you that in one, one, uh, uh, the Thursday a month from now, um, I'm going to have this a size for bread thing really, really down. And I'm trying to, you know, really, really finish it. And then, um, it sounds like Tony and I may have some disagreements. So we'll have a time to have, um, a dialogue there. Um, when, when, when we get there, if I don't win him over, but I'm going to make a really big effort to win Tony over before and also to win Jeff over. Um, and again, anybody interested in really getting into this and, and answering an important historical question, because if we, I believe, what William believes is the grain has not changed, that the Roman milling terms, Pliny's milling terms for um, the Roman flour terms can be correlated, I believe, to that same household wheaten and white. And, um, and, and I think we've got enough evidence to get at least really close to that. So it would be a big day. Um, if if um, I get my whole decks cleared with everything else and I can talk in two weeks, I will do that. Or I'm talking to Rachel Lawden and we possibly could some other um, really, really, really fine guest speakers on the, 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 the caliber of, of Tony. So again, thank you so much, Tony. Thank you everyone so much for coming. See you next time. <laughs>